Good afternoon, everybody. It is Tuesday, April 25th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We're going to start our afternoon session with two presentations, and we'll start with a proclamation recognizing AFI's 20th anniversary, and that will be led by Council Member Stewart. Thank you, everyone. Um, joining us today is Todd Hitchcock, Director of AFI, Tiffany Graham Golden, Director of Marketing and Events, and Abby Algar, Director of Programming. Thanks for coming today. So today, we have the honor to recognize a treasure in the county, the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center. The AFI has drawn people from around the area and the world to downtown Silver Spring to appreciate film, learn about the history of cinema, and have a great outing in our vibrant downtown Silver Spring area. Also to build traditions. So today the AFI, or this year, celebrates its 20th anniversary. And I will say that I will always remember the anniversary of the AFI because it's also the year my youngest was born. And today actually happens to be her birthday, so I feel like this is uh, <laughs> very fitting. Um, because the AFI to our family is also about building traditions. Um, our family lives very close to the AFI, and in December, around the holiday time, it is our tradition to always see It's a Wonderful Life at the AFI. And the AFI gift certificates are always stocking, stuckers, uh, st stocking stuffers in our house. So thank you so much for all you do. And for 20 years, the AFI has provided a source of entertainment, diversion, and reflection through its programs like film festivals, AFI docs, which draws nationally and internationally acclaimed filmmakers and storytellers to Silver Spring. AFI has also provided an unparalleled resource to young artists in our community to find inspiration, meet others in the field, and refine their skills as part of a national community. We look forward to the next 20 years to be inspired, challenged, and transformed by new movies new and old. So congratulations on 20 years. Um, and Director Hickshop, would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you, Kate, and thank you to the council. And just on behalf of all of us at the AFI Silver, it's been an amazing 20 years. And we're looking forward to everything that the future holds for both our theater and Silver Spring and, and the county at large and the region at large. So thank you very much for honoring us this way. Great, and I will uh, read the proclamation. The type is really tiny. All right. Whereas the historic Silver Theater, designed by renowned architect John Everson, first opened its doors in 1938. Following its rehabilitation and restoration through a public private partnership between Montgomery County and the American Film Institute, the AFI Silva Theater and Cultural Center was reopened in 2003 as an Art Deco showcase for film and film education. And whereas the AFI Silva Theater and Cultural Center quickly became a community gathering spot that reinvigorated downtown Silver Spring and became a cornerstone of Montgomery County's efforts to revitalize the area. And whereas it is now a state-of-the-art film and digital media exhibition venue and one of the nation's premier film theaters, hosting annual film festivals that bring visitors from across our region and internationally, including the AFI Latin American Film Festival, the AFI European Union Film Showcase, and many more showcases of classic, international, and novel film series. And whereas the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center has contributed to the revitalization of downtown Silver Spring and has become an integral part of the Montgomery County arts and cultural scene, dedicated to artists, educators, and general audiences alike. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby recognizes and celebrates the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center's 20th anniversary and recognizes the state-of-the-art moving image exhibition, education, and cultural center dedicated to presenting the richness of American and world cinema, exploring all forms of the moving image in, di in the digital era, and serving as a hub for cultural and educational events. And furthermore, let it be known that the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center's contributions to the community have been invaluable, and it will continue to be a beacon of cinematic excellence for many years to come. 
presented this day, the 20th of April, in the year 2003. Thank you, Councilmember Stewart, for that pro uh, for that proclamation to AFI for your years of wonderful storytelling, and to Ray Barry also, uh, who recently retired from his stewardship at AFI. And next, we have a proclamation recognizing Autism Acceptance Month. Uh, this will be led by Councilmembers Jawando and Albernaz and the County Executive. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to, I don't see the county executive, but I know he cares about this deeply, so we're going to get started, though, and, and if he joins us, that would be great. Uh, I think, so everyone who's here, I see some of you in the audience to celebrate. Uh, is, I see Odell Brunetto, uh, Jen Lynn, um, Carla Neighbors is here. Come on down. Is Don here? Yes, okay, there you go. Come on. Karen Gibson? Everybody who's here for the for the ASD month, come on, come on down. All right. Well, incredibly, it's already <laughs> good to see everybody. It's already a, almost the end of April, but we couldn't let it pass without uh, celebrating and taking the time to recognize Autism Acceptance Month. Um, the theme this year is celebrating differences. Uh, and I think that's something that we strive to do very well here in Montgomery County. Um, this is a great moment for all of us individually and as a county uh, to recommit uh, to honoring the unique perspectives uh, for people with autism. Uh, it's imperative that we each use the influence we have to improve equity, inclusiveness at the individual, operational, and systemic levels. I want to break down some of the buzzwords we hear because they have real meaning and they're important. Yeah, come on down, Mark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Acceptance of autism and other neurodiversity leads to inclusiveness. Inclusive spaces require real action steps to first identify differences and then deliberately account for and integrate those differences into making progress and into our practices. One important way we are making pro progress in the county in the acceptance of autism is the increased rate of diagnosis in children um, and in girls. Uh, my uh, daughter Addison, who always loves this day, is uh, on the autism spectrum and is the only girl in her class. Um, and that has been a traditionally an issue with identification, but we've, got, we've gotten better in this county and across the country. Acceptance is loving our community, celebrating differences as a superpower, as I tell Addison every day. Differences are your superpower. Um, and I just want to thank all of the folks behind us here for who were here from uh, representatives shortly for what they do to identify the superheroes in our community. Um, I want to turn first to Council Member Albernaz, and then we'll turn to the County Executive, and then we'll hear from Jen Lynn, and then we will read the proclamation. Council Member Albernaz. Thank you so much, Councilmember Jawando. And it is so appropriate that we are changing the name from awareness to acceptance. Montgomery County has strived to be a leader in welcoming and supporting and providing love and affection to our autism community. We are fortunate to have incredible community-based organizations, many of which are represented behind us this evening, starting with our Department of Health and Human Services, Aging and Disability Services team our Up County Community Resources team, and after the County Executive, you will hear from Jen Lynn, 
our community support services, Montgomery County DHHS Autism Waiver Team, the Ivy Mount School. And for those of you that have never been to an Ivy Mount graduation, do yourself a favor and go. Uh, it is an emotional and extraordinary event every year. It's something I always try to not miss because I come away feeling inspired by not just the staff, which is reflective of the incredible professionals that are doing this work every day, but more importantly, the families and the participants. It just shows what's possible when we all work together. And of course, we also have representatives from the Autism Society as well. So this is an important month, uh, but it, this is a year-round effort, and we are deeply committed to it on this council. As evidence, just a few weeks ago, we unanimously passed the development of the brand new IDD Commission, which will put Montgomery County in a better position to support and advocate for our autism and other IDD community members. With that, I now want to introduce our county executive, Mark Elrich, to say a few words as well. So it's been a busy week this week. We had the Autism After 21 breakfast to start the week, and I was over at um, what we now call We Achieve that, that uh, has been a longstanding fixture in Montgomery County for many years. Uh, so they, we have important community partners, and we know that. Um, this autism is, is a growing issue in the county. We've seen a 4.5% jump in autistic students year over year. And in the last 10 years, the school population has grown by 19%. And so this continues to provide challenges. It's one of the things that the school system asked for in this budget was the additional staff to deal with that because you need additional supports in the classroom rather than just a regular classroom teacher if you're going to be addressing students with autism as well as other disabilities. And I want to thank the council for working together to create the, um, the new committee which recognizes that we are putting too much of a load on the other committee to deal with everything regarding disabilities. This allows us to focus more clearly on intellectual disabilities. So I'm very happy to see that happen. Uh, we've put about half a million dollars in this budget uh, to work with the state to expand um, autism programs. Um, the county is, uh, has early intervention screening programs identify um, autism in newborns up to three-year-olds. And last year, the council and I approved money for early intervention screening programs, more than 120,000 proposed for next year, and 600,000 we expect to be spent over the next five years. And together, our collective resources can certainly help make a difference. And their diagnosis and treatment and you know support are absolutely critical, and I think all of us continue to look at some of the scientific discoveries that have that have been occurring and hoping that one of these pans out to be something more than just uh, another wishful hope but there seems to be you know a lot of intent research taking place in this field so I want to thank everybody who supports us everybody behind us who makes it possible for people to be safe and feel welcome in this community and we're going to continue to do what we need to do to expand that so thank you all I know. I have never followed the executive before. It's a little intimidating. I am Jen Lynn, the director of Up County Community Resources. If you haven't heard of us, we're based in the Up County, my living room, actually. Um, <laughs> really, no. Um, it, is a, it is a party. Um, we provide a lot of social activities and enrichment in the way of job training, weekend respite, intensive work skills for all the adults that graduate from high school and kind of you know hit that cliff, as we all talk about. Um, and I'm thrilled that we can support several hundred families um, in the Up County, and frankly, people come from all over um, because there's such a great, great need. Um, can I, I've got to read my thing now because I'm shaking. Okay, um, I'm honored to be representing this very special, amazing population, not just the family members the love, and the loved ones with autism, but look at these advocates. Montgomery County is very, very blessed with so many strong voices. Thank you to the council, of course, for recognizing Autism Action Month. I just changed the name again. And um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> I am very proud of the county and the work we've done over the last few years to bolster resources for our children and adults with autism, as well as the work we have done in crisis response with law enforcement for those with complex autism plus mental health diagnoses, what I tend to call autism plus or invisible disabilities. I'm happy to report that autism now has a seat at the table in many of these discussions. This is a vulnerable population and we do still need more. Days like today bring hope to our families as more and more lawmakers become aware of the need for housing, necessary hospital resources, employment incentive programs, and opportunities, intensive and lifelong education. That's the key, lifelong education. We're never going to be successful if everything stops after high school. Those with autism, of course, are not the only ones in need. We need to wrap our arms around the families who are exhausted, confused, traumatized as they're trying to untangle the web of DDA and Medicaid services. As a community, we are thrilled with the formation of the IDD and Autism Commission here in the county. This group will help us gain access to needed support and resources. Thank you to Montgomery County for leading the way and creating the separate commission and for always supporting many of the nonprofits who raise up and love our families with autism. Hope um, having that day, it really, really matters to us. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, we're going to sort of split up the proclamation here, and I'll start and we'll rotate between the county executive and Councilman Robinson. You will next year. Okay, got it. Whereas autism spectrum disorder, ASD or autism, is the spectrum of developmental conditions characterized by differing learning abilities, social communication challenges, and repetitive behaviors and patterns of thought, and Whereas one in 44 children are diagnosed with autism in the United States, highlighting the need to inform parents and the broader community about the importance of early diagnosis to provide the necessary social and academic support for children to attain their full potential. And? <laughs> Pretty good news. <laughs> okay, whereas Montgomery County's advocacy organizations and support programs have worked tirelessly to assist individuals experiencing ASD and their families with medical, financial, and other critical resources while working to improve inclusivity in all walks of life and... Whereas autistic individuals must be valued and accepted in every corner of society, neurodivergent people deserve to be confident in their ability to achieve success in their endeavors given their intelligence, creativity, and talent, and whereas a community that is understanding and accept, accepting of ASD will value the unique qualities and gifts that individuals with autism can contribute in a work or school environment, as well as in daily life. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Executive Mark Elrich, County Council Members Will Juando and Gabe Albernaz, and the entire Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaim April 23, 2023, as Autism Acceptance Month, or Action Month, as Jen said, and be, it, and be it further resolved that we encourage all county residents to join in raising awareness for autism support programs and education and to join us in recognizing and celebrating ASD individuals for their diverse and creative contributions to Montgomery County. Uh, presented on the 25th, this day, the 25th of April, 2023, signed by myself, the County Executive and Council Member Albernaz. Congratulations to all.
Okay, everybody. It is 1.30, and given that we have a number of public hearings, wanted to wait till 1.30 to make sure that everybody who wanted to testify was present and ready. But before we get to those public hearings, we will start with general business. So, Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements or agenda changes? Uh, good afternoon, Council President, uh, Council Vice President, Council Members. We do have one announcement today, um, a public hearing on additional amendments to the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program received from the County Executive and from the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission is scheduled for Tuesday, May 9th, 2023 at 1.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and there are no minutes to approve. So with that, we will go on to our first uh, item on our agenda, which is a public hearing on the Planning Board draft amendment to the master plan for the historic preservation for the Edward U. Taylor Elementary School and Weller's Dry Cleaning. A Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee work session is scheduled for June 12th. Those wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration must do so by the close of business on June 5th. We have 10 speakers for this item. I'm gonna bring the first four in person down. Um, Mr. Jeff Zients, Zara Nasser, Eileen Magukian, and Joan Kelly. Good afternoon. Chair Zions, you have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Zions. I'm here representing the planning board as, as chair. Uh, I'm here to support the historic designation uh, of one of the two properties that were evaluated. The planning board recommends that the council designates as historic the Edward U. Taylor Elementary School and Boyd's. The Planning Board recommended the Council not designate as historic Weller's Dry Cleaning in Silver Spring. Two recently adopted master plans uh, uh, recommended these sites for evaluation. The Mark Rail Community Sector Plan in, in 2019 did so, as did the Silver Spring Downtown Plan adopted in 22. The Planning Board reviewed and evaluated each site at duly advertised public hearings. We took testimony from the public and property owners and interested parties. Chapter 24A requires the Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Board to examine properties against designated criteria looking at architecture and, and historic significance. The Historic Preservation Commission recommended that both meet the designated criteria and the planning board and council should designate both resources as historic. However, the planning board came to a different conclusion for Weller's Dry Cleaner. The planning board found that the Taylor School met three criteria dealing with architecture and historic significance and that the environmental setting, also known as the boundary of designation, could be considered somewhat smaller than the entire parcel. The Planning Board did not support the historic designation of the Weller's Dry Cleaner site in Silver Spring. The Planning Board, uh, in a three to two vote, did not favor the, the, that the building or the site meet the, hist the historic significant criteria laid out in Chapter 23A of the Code. I will note that while the Planning Board and HPC differed in their recommendations, both Planning Board uh, and the a Historic Preservation reached their conclusion considering the facts and recommendations from staff after taking into account uh, testimony from multiple perspectives. The, the Board under the County Code is to apply the criteria. The Council is a, uh, obliged to undertake its own historic review and to the extent which the proposed deck designation achieves the purpose of historic preservation in preserving and enhancing the quality of life in the county. We look forward to participating in your proceedings. Thank you, Chair Zions. Ms. Nasser. 
Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Zara Nasser. I'm here on behalf of the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, as an architecture and historic preservation graduate living in Montgomery County for 14 years after immigrating to the United States from Iran, I've worked on projects that preserve historic buildings while promoting new development and benefiting owners. Uh, as an HBC member, part of a nine-member team appointed by the County Council, our commission consists of professionals specializing in architecture, history, historic preservation, and urban plan, working on recommending amendments to the master plan for historic preservation. HBC strongly believes in preserving architectural and cultural heritage to connect with our past, enrich the present, and shape the future. The HBC urges urges designating Edward Dew Taylor School as a master plan historic site for its low role as a rare modern school for black students during segregation in Montgomery County. Its history highlights the closure of small black schools, advocacy for modern facilities, school desegregation, and the African American community's burden in, implement in implementing desegregation policies. No other MPHB listed properties preserve this crucial history. The HBC also found evidence to recommend designating Belair's dry cleaning site as a master plan historic site, meeting two designation criteria with the environmental setting covering the whole parcel. As a rare googie style uh, architecture example in Montgomery County, it exhibits dramatic angular facade and features vibrant colors and futuristic signage. Preserving the site enhances community diversity and connects to architectural heritage. The proposed designation of this, these sites aligns with the master plan for historic preservation and the objectives of the Mark Rail Community Sector Plan and the Silver Spring Downtown and Adjacent Communities Plan. Both plans, endorsed by the community, directed the planning department staff to assess the Taylor School and Dwellers' Right Cleaning for potential historic site designation. In publicly advertised hearing, the HBC evaluated both proposals, considering testimonies from various stakeholders. Following Chapter 24A, the HBC assessed properties based on designation criteria, focusing on architectural and historical significance. Using staff reports and expertise, the HBC determined both sites met criteria and recommended, recommended to restore the designation to the planning board and council. Historic preservation in Montgomery County has been a win-win for property owners in the community for over 40 years, showing that properties can be preserved, developed, or repurposed. Examples like Canada Dry Building and Silver Theater in Silver Spring creates a sense of place, revitalizing the streetscapes and establishing a unique, distinctive location. As a Silver Spring resident, witnessing the preservation of the Veller's Dry Cleaning site would attest to our community's dedication to honoring its past while embracing its future. It would serve as a constant reminder of our architectural heritage and the importance of preserving the distinctive character that sets our community apart. In conclusion, I strongly advocate for the council to designate both sites as historical sites with the environmental setting, including the entire parcel. I extend my gratitude to the council for its dedication to upholding our community's architectural and historical heritage. Thank you, Ms. Nasser. Uh, next, uh, Ms. McGuckian. Good afternoon. I'm Eileen McGuckian. I'm the president of Montgomery Preservation, which favors designation of both sites. Edward U. Taylor School and Weller's Dry Cleaning both exceed county standards for designation. Both are significant mid-20th century buildings, but while one, one's future is secure, the other needs protection now. The career of Emory Grove na native Edward Taylor parallels that of Edwin Broom, who as superintendent chose a supervisor for colored schools. Over 30 years, while Broom expanded to 12 grades and new buildings, Taylor fought for teacher salary, summer training, and maternity leave. He was principal of the first high school, and in the 1930s and 40s closed small schools in favor of better facilities. Taylor's school was a move toward equal treatment just before Brown versus Board. Weller's dry cleaning stores are best surviving example of Googie style architecture. Its physical presence is crucial to understanding the development of Silver Spring in 20th century Montgomery County. For more than two decades, Wellers has been highlighted in official surveys and adopted master plans and in a publication that should be required reading for all elected officials. I'll loan you my copy. In every instance, 
County plans called for saving this building. Today, MPI joins a large group of experts and advocates, planning staff, the HPC, and two knowledgeable planning board members. In 44 years since preservation became a public goal, the planning board has mostly ignored the era, an era that brought huge change in commercial and residential development and architectural styles. It is not adequately represented on the master plan, so we are losing icons of period architecture, particularly Down County. It is high time to act decisively because when a building is gone, it is gone. Addressing the objective of Weller's owner, the objection of Weller's owner. Owners are key to maintaining an historic property for future generation. Very few laws require owner consent for designation. Neither Maryland nor Montgomery County require it. This is solid ground. The US Supreme Court weighed in more than once on local government's right to enact laws that allow communities to save history and be beautiful as well as healthy, clean, and protected. Over time, owner objections fade as situations change, incentives are availed of, creative new uses are found, and communities recognize preservation as a public benefit. Some county sites designated over their objection of their owners are Silver Spring Theater and Shopping Center, Carver High School and Junior High School um, College, um, the Riley Joe Henson, jo the Riley Josiah Henson House. Designation will not restrict this owner from developing her property. Googie Charm will attract customers as part of a future project, and designation offers incentives to keep it as the gateway to Fenton Village. Whoever the owner and whatsoever its use, Wellers deserves to gracefully play age in place. In closing, MPI urges you to act courageously and designate Wellers Store and Taylor School on the Master Plan for Historic Preservation. Thank you very much, Ms. McCookie. And, uh, and finally on this panel, Ms. Kelly. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the council. My name is Joan Taylor Kelly, the daughter of Edward Ulysses Taylor. I want to thank the members of the Montgomery County Council for considering his honor by giving the Edward U. Taylor School building historic designation. We were pleased when one of the four consolidated schools of, for black children constructed in the 1950s was named in his honor. Our pleasure was added when the referral to you by the planning board for consideration of historic designation. The Taylor family and the Boyd's community thanked the council for considering the recommendation made by the county planning board to make the Edward U. Taylor School one of the historic sites in the county. This building stands as a memorial to him. Edward Taylor came from a family that instilled in him the value of education. Much of his educational training was obtained in the District of Columbia institutions. After earning his baccalaureate from Howard University, he returned to the, his home community and was named the supervisor of colored schools in Montgomery County. His office was in his home where he assumed the duties and expenses of operating that office. He was involved in many of the initiatives <clears throat> related to the training of Negro teachers. He, um, the co creation and operation of the first high school for Negro children, students. Um, he also taught in the high school in addition to his supervisor responsibilities. He encouraged community involvement in the education of children and the development of extracurricular activities which broadened students' horizons. The Boyd's area is one of historic interest as the Taylor School is adjacent to the preserved Old Boys Negro Elementary School and next to the Cal Ripken baseball field. The Taylor School is the only formally consolidated Negro Elementary School that housed both white and black students after desegregation from 1950 to 1961. 
a county official who knew my father paraphrased the expression, quote, there are kings and there are persons who create kings, unquote, unquote. Then there's the quote that there are community leaders and there are individuals who provide the guidance, guidance for persons to become community leaders. Edward Taylor was that kind of teacher. His energies were expended toward this end professionally and in his community. He developed a terminal illness and died in 1951 without knowing that he had been honored by having a school named in his honor. As the sole survivor of his family, I am pleased that he is again having an action taken to honor his memory and to preserve the history of the growth of Montgomery County Schools. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Kelly, for uh, joining us today and for bringing your, your father's memory and legacy into this space as we deliberate. Uh, thank you all for your testimony this afternoon. Next, I'd like to bring up three more individuals who are here in person, Mary Reardon, uh, uh, Bekalek Delegni, and Dagmawi Lakiu. Very good. Ms. Rudin, we'll start with you. Right in, by the microphone below it. Nope. Uh, there's, here we go. There, up. Oh, you had. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Red light's on, perfect. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Reardon, and I'm representing the Silver Spring Historical Society. Our president is submitting a written statement. Silver Spring Historical Society enthusiastically joins with other preservation groups and experts and the Historic Preservation Commission in affirming that the Willers Dry Cleaning Building and Sign are eligible for listing on the County Master Plan for Historic Preservation. It's important to remind council members what propelled this process. County planners in the recently approved Silver Spring Sector Plan singled out Wellers to be studied for potential listing on the Master Plan. The Historic Preservation staff promptly set this recommendation in motion. My point is that the Historic Preservation Commission was not prompted by an immigrant family's purchase of this property, as some of our opponents have claimed, a preposterous accusation against commissioners and staff, and an example of the hostility directed at preservationists. I've often been awed by the Wellers Building. I was fascinated with its mixture of construction materials, colorful striped panels, and the bright geometric shapes of the sign, even before I learned about an architectural style called googie. The label Googie itself is another tool of hostility by opponents of designation. They've implied that unfamiliarity with the term means the style is not a serious architectural category, as if unfamiliarity with the term prairie style would de delegitimize the architecture of Frank Lord Wright. Preservationists have long valued the small independent businesses in Silver Springs, Fenton Village, particularly their ethnic diversity. During the sector plan work sessions, Preservationists urged that Fenton Village's small businesses and moderate-scale affordable buildings like Weller's be preserved. Weller's long history of service in Fenton Village was begun interestingly by sons of Lithuanian immigrants. Weller's familiar, unique design and its embodiment of the Googie style meet two legal criteria for historic designation, affirmed by the HPC, yet barely touched on by the three planning board opponents of designation. We are aware that the Wellers owner considers designation incompatible with the family's plans for this site and her other properties. And she is frustrated in encountering county regulations on preservation and also on environmental remediation requirements. But government regulations are part of the cost of doing business. And with its colorful elements restored, the unique features of Wellers could attract customers to businesses located there or provide a stunning entrance to a future housing or commercial structure on the site. Moreover, demolition would involve environmental remediation costs at this former dry cleaning site. 
The new occupant of the building has retained the structural elements of the Weller's building sign. The inverted triangle element contains text in Amharic, the official language of Ethiopia. So this new business contributes to the medley of cultures. There's a pride of Fenton Village. To conclude, Silver Spring Historical Society strongly urges the council to list the Weller's building and sign on the master plan for historic preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reardon. Next, Mr. Delalegne. Ms. Delalegne, my apologies. <coughs> Good afternoon. My name is Becker Sterling. My family and friends call me Becky. I'm an immigrant. I'm a woman. I'm a black woman. As you can hear, you can hear me now. I always have a heavy accent when speaking English. How is this relevant to this case? You may ask. It is relevant because I have had a long and extremely difficult journey to get to this point in my life. I have been discriminated against countless times only because I am an immigrant. I have been kicked and knocked down countless times only because I am a woman and I am black. I have been understand countless time only because I have a heavy accent when speaking English. In the past two hearing, when we ap appeared in front of the Historic Preservation Committee, I once again in my life saw the very thing I just mentioned, but only this time. It was from a group of people who claim to be interested in preserving history. The only history I see being preserved is the same history where immigrants like myself come to this country and work so hard against all odds, only to be told by complete strangers that I don't have the right to do what I want with my property. They are coming keep coming and telling me that. When I think of the time 8237 Fenton Street was constructed, what did women's rights look like during that time? That is the story, the, the history I see being preserved. In the first two hearings, the staff of the Historic Preservation Committee spoke highly of architect, a man who is from the deep south. What was the history of this country during the time this property was designated and built? I'm sure we can call, agree, it was not pleasant. However, here you are trying to preserve that history. In, in the first two hearings, it looks it took a lot of strength to hold in my emotion and not say what I really felt. I was crying on the inside and kept telling myself not to speak of these things. But all you are doing now is what everyone else has already done to me for half of my life. This isn't the first time I have faced discrimination and it probably won't be the last. However, I truly hope that you'll prove me wrong today and deny this request to designate 8237 Fenton Street as historic because there is nothing historic about it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, and final on this panel is Mr. Lackey. <coughs> Thank you. It's good to be here. This is my mother. Uh, my name is Dagmawi, and I'm an immigrant son to two immigrant parents. My parents, who are the owners of the property, are also immigrants to this country. Before I begin my testimony, I wanted to point out that in the first three hearings, as the owners of the property, we were only given three minutes to testify, barely any time to make our case, while complete strangers and other nonprofits were given seven to eight minutes to make their case against our property. 
As I said in my previous testimony also, the Historic Preservation Commu Committee humiliated us in public. We not only didn't have a chance because they had already made up their minds even before we set foot in their room, they had stacked the decks against us. In our last hearing with the planning board, I was beyond shocked to find out that the hearing for Edward U. Taylor School was scheduled on the same day. That was done with the intention that since the Weller's property was so undesirable and had nothing historic about it, the HBC had to pair it with another case, another case with such a beautiful story and huge significance to history, such as the Edward U. Taylor School. By presenting these two on the same day, the HPC can make Wallers look as historic and significant as as well, which it isn't. It's a very disgraceful and sneaky thing to do. Despite all things, you, the council, did not get a recommendation from the planning board to designate Wallers as historic because, again, there's nothing historic about this property. Our 44th President of the United States, President Barack Hussein Obama, once in a speech called himself the guy with a funny name. Yes, we're used to being told no and being treated differently only because we have funny names. But even when it feels like the decks are stacked against us, we still obey the law, never cheat, pay our fair share in taxes, and believe that this place we call home, Montgomery County, does care about people with funny names. We worked so hard to get this far. We worked as parking lot attendants, we waited tables, cleaned toilets, changed diapers, sacrificed, sacrificed the whole lot, obeyed the law, paid our taxes, and the Historic Preservation Committee, along with a handful of people who have nothing to do with this property, want to tell us that we can't grow. We are being told this is as far as you go. That's devastating to even imagine. This is our history, my parents, my siblings, and all of our children's history. I respectfully ask you today to let us write our history and deny this property from being designated historic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lackey. Uh, thank you all for testifying this afternoon. We now have three individuals who will be joining us virtually. Uh, first is Miriam Schoenbaum. The Boise Historical Society asks the County Council to designate the Edward U. Taylor School building and property on the Master Plan for Historic Preservation. Forty years ago, the Historic Preservation Commission proposed only including the white part of Boyd up the hill in the Boyd's Historic District, which was then being created. According to the Washington Post, the explanation was that a historic district is established to preserve a coherent streetscape, and the properties down the hill in the African American white grounds community were said not to be architecturally or historically coherent. However, led by Betty Tally Hawkins, whose family attended the one-room uh, Boyd School for African American Children and who worked at the Taylor School, the Boyd Historical Society asked the County Council to designate the whole of Boyd's as historic, and the County Council voted to do so. Now we're asking the County Council to designate the Taylor School building and its property as historic. The Taylor School was the whole property, not just the building and the whole property should be designated historic. In addition, just practically, the whole area is on well and septic. It's supposed to remain on well and septic and it's on diabase bedrock and doesn't park. So it's not like anything else could be built on the rest of the property anyway. As uh, Edward Taylor's daughter, Miss Kelly said, the Taylor School is an important part of the history of the African American kinship communities in the Boyd's area and in Northwest Montgomery County, as well as the Montgomery County Schools and Montgomery County architecture. It deserves recognition and protection, and we are very happy to see this happening at last. Thank you, Ms. Schoenbaum. Uh, next is Dan Reed. Hi, can you hear me? Awesome. We um, hear you. My name is Dan Reed. I'm the Regional Policy Director for Greater Greater Washington. I'm also a neighbor of the site in East Silver Spring, and uh, we'd like to echo uh, the Planning Board's decision earlier this year that this building should not uh, get historic designation. Uh, I'd submit a written comments to the board, but I'm going to go off script here. You know, there's a lot of meaningful history in Silver Spring. It's my neighborhood. I lived in a converted uh, Canada dry bottling plant for several years, in part because of the hard work of the Silver Spring Historical Society. That was great. Something like that could happen here, but should it, right? 
you know, there was a long conversation with the planning board about whether this building was a good example of Guji architecture. I think the jury's out on that. And I, you know, I have an architecture degree. You know, you can, you can hear from me, you can hear from anybody else. Uh, the burdens of remediating this property, if we decide it is in fact historic, and then incorporate the existing building into new construction is no small feat. We should take that seriously. You know, just like the owners of this property, my family emigrated here from the Caribbean. They also brought, bought properties. They also started businesses. They have funny names too. I can only imagine how frustrating this experience must be for this family, right? You know, as we testified at the board back in February, we also think it's important for people today to be able to leave their mark on downtown Silver Spring the way that Mr. Weller did 70 years ago when he built this building at a time when the current owners or my family, frankly, weren't really welcome in Silver Spring. Uh, we should also, you know, as the council, I hope, take seriously the other competing goals here. Does it serve racial equity to place further hardship on this Ethiopian immigrant family trying to build a life here? Does it serve our housing shortage to put more burdens on this constrained property zone for housing? Does it uh, serve our fight against climate change to reduce the ability for people to live in and invest in a walkable transit rich neighborhood? I think the answer to all those questions is no. Uh, and I hope that the council will uphold those things, will uphold the values that we hold dear in Montgomery County and in Silver Spring and uh, give this property a chance and give this family a chance. And that means uh, denying historic designation for this property. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reed. And final speaker on this item is Deborah Calfi. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Chalfie, and I'm the preservation chair of the Art Deco Society of Washington. I'm coming to you live from the World Congress on Art Deco in Miami Beach. So I apologize if you're hearing some bus noise. Um, you, all of you know that Wellers was singled out in the sector plan as deserving of consideration for preservation. It represents the consensus of the planning board and the council in approving the sector plan. Wellers would have never been spotlighted and approved in the sector plan unless there was widespread confidence that it met the criteria and there was agreed upon support for its preservation. The Historic Preservation Committee fulfilled its role. However, the planning board, the interim temporary planning board, fell down on the job. They did not follow the legal criteria. Uh, three of the board members had to be admonished repeatedly by Chair Zients and uh, the senior counsel uh, to, to base their arguments on legal criteria rather than a motion and red herrings. There is nothing anti-immigrant about wanting to preserve Wellers. Uh, as Dan Reed just noted, Wellers was founded by an immigrant from an immigrant family. Uh, it's the small scale and affordability of small buildings in Fenton Village that has made it accessible to immigrant entrepreneurs who are trying to get a toehold in Silver Spring. So there's nothing anti-immigrant and there's also nothing anti-development about wanting to preserve Wellers. Um, it's not an either or decision. There's adaptive reuse and there are many buildings in Silver Spring and the county where uh, there's been further development, but also preservation. In fact, just recently, Roadside Ventures uh, has announced it's going, it's bought the property where the Tasty Diner is, but they're going to preserve the rail car that uh, is landmarked. So it's, it's, just take some creative, adaptive reuse in order to fulfill both goals of you know, historic preservation and continuing development. Uh, since the planning, the temporary planning board ignored the legal criteria and they ignored the unanimous expert opinion and evidence supporting designation in the master plan, we urge you to do exactly what Chair Zients said undertake your own review of the documentary evidence. Please read the Art Deco Society's written statement, which is submitted for the record, and please make your own judgment. We can find a way to do both. Thank you. Thank you very much, 
Ms. Kalfi for joining us virtually. As I noted at the beginning of this public hearing, a planning, housing, and parks committee work session is scheduled for June 12th. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. On to the next public hearing. This is a public hearing on expedited bill 1923, Department of Police, Pension and DSRP adjustments. This bill would amend eligibility requirements with eligibility based upon the employer's employees' normal retirement date, amend Group F pension multipliers for the integrated retirement plan, and generally amend the law regarding retirement plans for Group F members. A government operations and fiscal policy work session will be scheduled at a later date. Those wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration must do so by the close of business on May 2nd. We have one speaker for this public hearing, uh, Mr. Lee Holland. Good afternoon, Council President Glass, members of the County Council. For the record, my name is Lee Holland. I am the president of FOP Lodge 35, and we represent over 1,500 active and retired Montgomery County law enforcement officers. I urge the Council to support Bill 1923 pension and DRSP adjustments. As you know, recruitment and retention is a major concern for Lodge 35 and the executive branch. This bargaining cycle, Lodge 35 focused our efforts on providing pay and retirement that will make Montgomery County competitive with neighboring jurisdictions and a place where current employees see longevity. While salary and benefits are not the only issues severely impacting morale, causing retirement and recruitment issues, it is an important first step in trying to fix the issue. Police pensions have been stagnant for more than 15 years and has fallen behind many of our neighboring jurisdictions. The last enhancement made to the police retirement was the bargained Deferred Retirement Savings Program. Bill 1923 was bargained in good faith to fix technical issues with drop, keep up with prior changes in Social Security, and to provide a final retirement uh, percentage that keeps Montgomery County competitive with neighboring jurisdictions. These enhancements were bargained to be implemented at different points in, in time in order to make it affordable and to retain members that would otherwise just retire. Again, I would stress the importance of passing Bill 1923, which will help our county fill the large number of open positions within the Montgomery County Police Department. I look forward to working with the council over the next few weeks as this bill is being considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Um, with that, this public hearing is now closed. Next item is a public hearing on expedited bill 2023, OPT SLT bargaining units, pension and retirement adjustments. This bill would amend group E eligibility to add eligibility for certain ECC positions to the Group E Optional Retirement Plan and the Integrated Retirement Plan, amend Group J eligibility to add eligibility for certain ECC positions to be designated by the Chief Administrative Officer, amend Credited Service to provide Credited Service adjustments for military service, separate Group E and Group J regarding pension multipliers, adjust pension multipliers for Group E and Group J, amend the Guaranteed Retirement Savings Plan to default into the Guaranteed Retirement Savings Plan certain for certain part-time employees in the OPT SLT bargaining unit, amend the Disability Benefits Plan, and generally amend pension and retirement benefits. A government operations and fiscal policy work committee, uh, committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Those wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration must do so by the close of business on May 2nd. And we have no speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. The next item is a public hearing on expedited bill 2123, fire and rescue services credited service for Group G members. This bill would amend the optional retirement plan and integrated retirement plan pension multipliers in Group G of employees' retirement system, amend the Group G optional retirement plan to provide the same level of sick leave credit benefits provided for county employees in Group G integrated retirement plan, amend the Group G pension cost of living adjustment and generally amend the law regarding retirement plans for Group G members. 
A Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee work session will be scheduled for a later date. Those wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration must do so before the close of business on May 2nd. We have one speaker for this hearing, Mr. Jeff Buttle. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Jeff Buttle. I'm the President of the Montgomery County Career Firefighters Association. We are a local affiliate of the International Association of Firefighters and represent over 1,100 career firefighters and paramedics employed with the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service. On behalf of our members, I'm here to support expedited bill 2123. This legislation is necessary to enact the pension changes that were collectively bargained with the county executive. It is part and parcel to the funding decisions that will be before uh, the council uh, later this afternoon on the agenda. And it's important to remember that these changes were part of an overall agreement uh, that was negotiated to address both recruitment and retention issues uh, of firefighters, which we've had uh, many detailed discussions uh, with the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee uh, during the uh, uh, several work sessions that we had on the collective bargaining agreements. Uh, I did have a summary uh, of what the legislation would do, although I think the Council President did a fine job in his introduction of the bill, uh, so I won't repeat that. The one thing I would like to note is um, there is part of the uh, legislation that's pending is to uh, fix and correct uh, something that was an oversight on uh, some legislation that was previously passed by this council uh, that had to do with uh, the value of, of unused sick leave uh, that was applied towards pension credits. We actually have one member uh, that is still in the optional Group G retirement plan uh, because they were hired prior to uh, 19 78 uh, when the mandatory integrated plan uh, went into effect for county employees. Uh, when we did that previous legislation, we inadvertently left that one member out by not amending the section of the optional integrated plan. Uh, so there is a legislative fix to, uh, to take care of that one member to make sure that they have the same benefits available to them as the rest of the bargaining unit. Uh, so with that, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Buttle. And with that, this public hearing is now closed. Next is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget to the Montgomery County Public Schools and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act Part B grant in the amount of $1,629,727. The source of funds are federal grants. An Education and Culture Committee work session is scheduled for April 26th, and the council has already accepted materials uh, for consideration up and through April 19th. We do not have any speakers for this public hearing, so this public hearing is now closed. The next item is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget for Montgomery County Public Schools and the American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund homeless children and youth grant in the amount of $1,065,736. The source of funds are federal grants. An Education and Culture Committee work session is scheduled for April 26th, and the Council accepted additional material for consideration up and through April 19th. We do not have any speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. Uh, next is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the county government's FY23 operating budget for Montgomery County Public Schools and the Maryland Department of the Environment Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust grant in the amount of $349,393. The source of funds are state grants. An Education and Culture Committee work session is scheduled for April 26th. The Council accepted additional materials for consideration up through April 19th. Uh, we do not have any additional speakers for this public hearing, and so this public hearing is now closed. That takes us to item number eight, colleagues. Uh, and this is an interview for applicants to the Board of Investment Trustees. So I would like to invite Mr. Barry Kaplan and Mr. Joseph Rinaldi up to the dais.
And Mr. Kaplan is here and Mr. Rinaldi is not here. He just left the room? Okay. Then we'll hang tight for a few minutes. Mr. Rinaldi, yes, sir. we are ready for the conversation. Very good, Mr. Kaplan, welcome. Mr. Rinaldi, welcome. Uh, we're gonna hop right into it. Appreciate uh, both of your interests in serving and continuing uh, to serve on the Board of Investment Trustees, a critically important component to uh, county, uh, our county uh, workforce, making sure that we have the resources uh, that they need uh, when they uh, retire. And so I have a series of questions and then we'll open it up to colleagues if they have any additional questions as well. Uh, the first question I have, and we'll start with Mr. Kaplan, um, if you could share with us your background, your knowledge and experience related to investment programs for defined benefit pension plans, defined contribution plans, and retire, retiree health benefit trusts, especially as it relates to establishing the asset allocation. Yeah, uh, good afternoon everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I would say just for starters, in addition to kind of serving in this capacity for the last three years, um, that experience with the health benefit trust and with the um, defined benefit plan. my I, I've been involved in asset management since 2005 when I graduated from business school. Um, when I, when I moved to the D.C. area, I uh, immediately started working for a pension called the National Railroad Retirement Investment Trust. Um, my day job is focused on a defined benefit plan. Um, in that capacity with the National Railroad Trust, I've worked uh, directly with multiple asset classes, asset classes that are also invested in by the kind of the employee retirement system and the health benefit trust. Um, I've been responsible for equity investments, uh, hedge fund investments, and private equity investments. Uh, in addition to kind of asset class specific work uh, that I've done, um, I am part of a team at the National Railroad Trust that focuses on asset allocation. So every three years we revisit our capital market assumptions. Each asset class is responsible for putting together their assumptions in both terms of risk and return, um, and from that, uh, we, we use kind of a standard mean variance optimization to determine what asset allocation we should be using uh, going forward. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Kaplan. Sure. Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, hit the button right in front of the mic. There I you go. That. Thank you. Um, well, I, thank, I thank you all for the opportunity uh, for me to be interviewed here today um, and to uh, serve the community further. Uh, it's important. Uh, to note that we serve in the same function that you're recruiting us for. Um, I currently manage uh, uh, assets for uh, Smirler, which is Southern Regional Library Association, a nonprofit 
they hired me about four months ago uh, to uh, be a 321 fiduciary for them. And we have several other um, clients in the area, uh, in Maryland and Montgomery County as well. Um, we have uh, written um, two policy statements for them um, and brought them into the 21st century, if you will. Uh, and we're very sensitive to um, um, the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds, or UFMA, as they say. I, mean, I saved UFMA for last because when I first heard it several years ago, I go, what is that? Um, but it's very important in the work that we do for other uh, institutions uh, and nonprofits. Um, I'd like to segue a little bit into what's not relevant in my career and start with involvement in the community. You all uh, read my bio, but I just want to mention a few things. I think it's very important. Um, we have an intern program that we draw from University of Maryland Hopkins, and we placed 102 students uh, over the last 10 years in full-time jobs, investment banking, uh, and banks. That's 100% placement. Um, no other uh, outplacement uh, area can, can uh, attest to that. Um, we gave desktop computers out to single parents in Montgomery County and even Prince George's County. Uh, that had their children take classes on their phone, which was unheard of. Um, I, am, I was, sorry, an adjunct professor at Maryland uh, Business School for seven years. Uh, I'm over at Hopkins now uh, as a pinch hitter. I haven't taught in a couple of years because of COVID, because I don't like to do virtual. I like to be hands-on. Um, we also feed over 125 homeless people here in Silver Spring Shepherd's Table on a quarterly basis, which I'm very proud of, and I bring my family to serve them as well. Uh, and the reason why I say all this is it's very important to look at the person, the man, the history, and I am an immigrant, by the way, because uh, I heard uh, the last uh, testimony. I think that's important uh, to follow that and mention that as well. Um, we also promote financial literacy. Uh, we've written books in Chinese and English both in the same book, right? Uh, Spanish and English, and we promote financial literacy throughout Montgomery County, PG County, and across the nation. I think that's huge. Um, my career accomplishments, I'll skim real quick, you've read my bio. Um, with uh, the FDIC, I served on bank boards, uh, investment committees, so I've traded over uh, $40 billion of assets in several asset classes. Uh, equity stocks, mutual funds, uh, derivatives, that's my specialty. Um, that's what I teach at uh, Hopkins in Maryland. Um, we also, uh, again, write policy statements for many, many retirement plans, and I mentioned one earlier, which is Smurler. Um, and a couple of my colleagues uh, at my, at my uh, company oversee uh, 17 billion worth of 529 plans in Nevada, and uh, also 5 billion worth of assets for Western and Southern in Ohio. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, next question, we'll start with you, Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, what is your understanding of the fiduciary duty of a pension plan trustee? <clears throat> no, your mic was still on. Sure. There you go. As the committee knows, there's two different types of uh, fiduciary, 321 and 328. Um, 321 is, is, well, in either case, you're aligning your interest along the same lines as the employee. So you have a fiduciary responsibility to educate them, to make sure they understand risk and reward, and that's part of our uh, financial literacy program as well. We ship out books to all employees um, so they can read in their native language, Chinese or Spanish or English. Uh, we currently have Korean and Russian on the, on the short list as well. Um, but the, the, the 328 is where you accept all liability as a trustee 
and I don't think most plans have that. Uh, but we, uh, as trustees, should make sure which one we want to be, 321 or 328. Thank you. Mr. Kaplan, same question. Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, pretty straightforward, and I agree with Mr. Rinaldi. I mean, the the responsibility is to the beneficiaries. Um, it's a, a selfless uh, task. You're not thinking of anything regarding yourself. You're thinking about what is best for the beneficiaries. They are relying on these um, retirement payments, and so you have to be mindful of the risk and the assets that you're investing in. The threshold should be much higher than what you would do for yourself. Uh, there are times when a, a pension can take more risk and less risk than you as an individual. And so you have to be thoughtful of, of putting together an asset plan that has the best likelihood of being able to provide for those um, those benefits that have been agreed to. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Thank you. Uh, next question, we'll start with you, Mr. Kaplan. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the most important issues facing public pension fund trustees today? Yeah, I would I would start with um, I would I would say there's there's two things, and one is probably a little bit more topical today than than historically. But but one, and and it's been mentioned, um, I, I think the last several items that were before this were were about you know being um, competitive in terms of retaining and recruiting talent um, of an investment staff. Um, for the overseers of the, the pension plan. So I think that is, that is very important, and that's, that's one that's a little bit more topical today than, than historically, just due to inflation and competitiveness. The second, and this is, a, a, this is an evergreen issue, is just about generating returns. So um, you know, what you've had most recently is the ability for fixed income products to generate healthy levels of returns you may be able to take uh, less risk than you historically have with your asset allocation and generate similar levels of returns. Um, you know, a lot of practitioners don't have a lot of success or a lot of history recently investing in kind of high inflationary periods. Uh, so that's definitely an issue facing a lot of pensions. And I would say um, the amount of risk taken on the illiquid side in terms of uh, private investments uh, you've seen a lot of um, you've seen a lot of assets uh, drift into higher returning, more liquid than more the more liquid space in order to generate returns. But you may not need to be doing that as much um, given given the um, the levels of returns that you're finding in fixed income. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, that's spot on. By the way, um, we've been shifting. Uh, and de-risking portfolios for the last year and a half because we recognized the Fed had uh, a task to do, which is raise interest rates. So we front-loaded uh, a lot of our uh, focus on uh, bank CDs, and we've been uh, enjoying uh, earning about five to five and a quarter percent for most of our clients in risk-free assets. So hence to his point, um, risk rewards very important, and. Um, that is a, a unique, unique issue that uh, plagues this industry because I tell clients all, all the time, uh, if you came to me and said, I don't want any risk and I want my money back in 10 years, I would buy a U.S. Treasury 10-year. Any, any textbook in the world will tell you that's risk-free. But if you did that last year, you're down 16%. Ouch. Risk-free. That's huge, huge liability on, on the board's, uh, the trust's uh, uh, shoulders as a 328, because you can be sued very easily for that misleading statement, which is not misleading. I know it's confusing, risk-free assets being down 15%. Um, that's number one. Also, very few trustees are, uh, are not familiar with uh, UFMA, um which which is very important um, and basically you have to understand in your modeling what happens to fixed income securities uh, on a holding period return basis if rates go up or down and basis points 50 100 300 basis points most uh, most boards don't realize that in addition if you look at uh, equities um, what happens to your holding period return when your earnings declines 10, 20, 30 percent 
conversely, if it goes up 10, 20, 30 percent, you have to have a model that takes into account. And that's what UFIRMA focuses on, understanding those risks and projecting forward. And I guarantee you, most pension plans don't do that. Thank you very much, Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, the next question for both of you is uh, part ethical discl disclaimer question uh, and statement. The county executive must not appoint any person who furnishes to pension funds and other institutional investors or any person who is employed by a firm that furnishes to pension funds and other institutional investors the kind of investment services purchased by the boards. Is there anything in your current employment that would create a conflict of interest with your obligations as a member of the board? Or are there any other potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? Mr. Rinaldi? None whatsoever. None. Very good. Uh, and uh, last set of uh, questions from me. The board meets four times a year from 8.30 a.m. until approximately 1 p.m., usually on Fridays in January, April, July, and October. Will you be able to make the time commitment that the board requires? Yes. Do you serve coffee? <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Very good. Um, colleagues, I do not see any questions from colleagues, um, so I will just add one last question of my own. Um, and that question is, as we here in the county try to uh, balance rate of return for our retirees, um, and also ethical considerations within investments. I'm curious your thoughts on investments in fossil fuel industries and other types of, of businesses. Mr. Kaplan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think um, this gets back to your point about uh, fiduciaries, right? I mean, I, I do think the, the primary focus is on doing whatever you can to make sure, doing whatever you can, but doing the responsible thing to make sure that the obligations for retirees um, are, are secure, are secure. To the extent that you can line up um, uh, with that kind of return objective, um, whether it be environmental or social or, or um, governance related matters, um, I, I think there are opportunities to kind of have some very successful overlapping investments. But I do think um, you have to have a good explanation and a good kind of support for um, combining the two. The, 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 the focus should be on making sure that you can provide for your retirees. Um, to the extent that um, things need to be legislated in order to combine um, maybe some other priorities along with returns, I, th that, that's reasonable. Um, but without, um, without that kind of layer of protection or that kind of emphasis from the community and from those beneficiaries that that, that, that these obligations are for, then I, I think with, without that information, then, then uh, returns need to be the focus. Thank you. Mr. Rinaldi. Permission to speak freely. Um, I'm a little older than the gentleman to my right. I've lived through the 70s, 80s, and um, I'm sad that we have to create laws to do the right thing. Um, I really am. Um, um, my good friend, John Cadenas, he heads Calimos, we talked many times, and uh, I inspired him to start an EFT that uh, invests money into ESG. Um, and he's hired a team to do that, a superior uh, uh, team, by the way. Um, one needs to be very careful in mandating X percent be placed in ESG just because it's the right thing to do. Um, I don't know if all of you are aware, um, 20 years ago, pension funds have hurdle rates of about 7%, and they would just buy 80% invested in bonds because you can earn 7% uh, in double and triple A bonds back in, back in the day. Um, over time, it amazes me to try to get that same hurdle rate. It's a mirror image. 70% is in illiquid assets and stocks. Uh, to compound that mistake and just legally require people to buy ESG, more stock, more equity, is a mistake, uh, in my opinion. 
Thank you both for your, your candid responses. I'll just personally say that I think we can be good to our beneficiaries and be good to our planet uh, and our investments and would encourage uh, whomever ultimately serves on this board of trustees to move us further in that direction. Well said. Uh, not seeing any other comments, uh, thank you both for joining us this afternoon. We will uh, deliberate and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for the time. Mr. Rinaldi. Uh, next colleagues, we're gonna go to a work session on the FY24 operating budget. Mr. Howard and Mr. Trumka. And colleagues, when we last met on uh, April 11th, we got an, uh, an overview on the operating budget. Uh, and in those presentations, it was uh, shared with us the uh, compensation, um, an analysis of the compensation that was included in the county executive's $6.8 billion budget. Um, and since that time, there have been uh, further analyses and um, uh, compensation packages ha that have uh, been sent over to us. So this conversation uh, is uh, taking us into a deeper dive into those compensation packages um, so that we can continue moving forward with our budget process. I'd first like to turn it over to the chair of the Government Operations Committee, Council Member Stewart. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee met on April 14th and 19th to discuss compensation and benefits for all agencies and made the recommendations listed in the staff packet. Um, today, I'm glad that the council staff will be able to provide an overview of the FY24 compensation and benefit enhancements in the executive's FY24 recommended budget. Um, I know first we'll hear about that overview and then after that discussion, uh, we'll come back to the collective bargaining agreements with the county's three unions and we'll walk through those. Um, just so folks know, overall, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee's deliberations led to a recommendation three to zero for the adoption of the resolutions to indicate the council's intent to improve provisions of the county employee collective bargaining agreements and I'm happy to speak more to this after the um, staff have a chance to talk about um, the compensation benefits overall. I'll pass it back to you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Balcom. Uh, okay, so you wanna wait, and would you like to wait? Everyone will wait until after the presentation. Uh, so Mr. Howard, we'll start with you or Mr. Trumka. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So what we'll do is we'll kind of walk through in a, a, a shortened, abbreviated version of the presentation we give to the GO committee so the rest of the council can, can hear that information as well. Um, there's the packet for today is, is very lengthy and very long. So there's the three different segments to it. Um, section A is the decision memos that the GO committee used on April 19th. Um, section B, pages B1 through B33, is the primary memo from uh, the April 14th work session, and that's what Mr. Trump and I are going to use as our kind of walkthrough. So that's if you want to follow along with us, that's what we'll be talking with. And then um, section C is some additional follow-up information that was requested at the uh, the two GO committee sessions, so we can um, discuss that as well if there are any questions on that. And so what we'll do is we'll walk through our presentation, we'll stop for any questions and answers, um, and then we can talk about the specific GO committee recommendations. As, uh, as you mentioned, Mr. President, just as a little bit of the kind of um, stage setting, um, compensation and benefits is kind of one of the first big decision points that the council takes up each year during the budget process, um, in part because of the, the um, statutory deadline for approving the collective bargaining agreements. Um, as we discussed during the budget overview, the, uh, the FY23 annualized costs from last year and then the FY24 costs um, total about uh, 91 or $92.6 million um, overall. Um, so it's a big portion of the, of the county's um, the budget and the recommended budget increase this year. We have received some questions about how does this all relate to the aggregate operating budget and the decision that the, the council will uh, make when it adopts the budget about the, the AOB level. Um, and so we did include some information on that on, on the front page. Um, in general, as you'll recall, in February, the council approved an AOB of uh, $5,686 million, which is an increase of $120 million about over the FY23 AOB. 
the executive's recommendation for FY24 was uh, $6,049 million, or $363 million above the council's approved level. Um, and so as we talked about uh, before, it requires eight votes to approve a budget that exceeds the, um, the, the AOB set by the council in February. Uh, the total tax supported cost of the compensation increases recommended by the executive, if you combine the annualizations with the FY24 adjustments, is about $93.2 million. Uh, so if the council does support these proposed um, enhancements, it will account for around 78% of the, the budget room um, quote you know, before the AOB is exceeded. Um, so if the council you know, wanted to not exceed AOB, it would need to make significant reductions in other parts of the budget. So just wanted to present that as a little bit of a stage setting for how some of these different decisions um, interplay with each other and interact with each other. Um, and with that, I will turn it back to our, our memo, uh, the B1 through 33. Um, the initial, we provide some budget and compensation context. Um, we've kind of already gone over that a little bit um, in the April 11th presentation, but just noting that the, the overall tax supported request for um, compensation uh, is about a 9.0% increase from FY23. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Trump to run through some of the components. So we'll go through some of the details now. We're on page B2 of, of the packet. Um, there are many compensation items in the CE's budget, and there are many details in the staff report. As Mr. Howard s said, we're not going to go through as many details as we did in front of the GEO committee, but please, if we gloss over an item when we're done, please come back and ask about them. So, rapid fire to go through. Page B2 in the middle of the page, it, the bullets show the range of pay increases recommended by the executive for different employee groups. If you look at the ranges, there are pretty large gaps in them. Generally, what, what we're seeing is that employees at the top of their salary grade would receive pay increases near the low end. Employees who will get a special pay increase, like a longevity increase or a past year increment, would receive pay increases at the top end of the range. But overall, the majority of county government employees under the executive's budget would qualify for pay increases in the neighborhood of 10%. There's a table on page three that summarizes the major increases but we're going to jump to page four for more of the details, starting with general wage adjustments. For McGeo members and non-represented employees, the executive recommends two GWAs, 3% um, in January of 2024, and a second one of 3% in June of 2024. For IAFF members and fire and rescue management, the executive recommends a single GWA of 3.2% in July. You'll note this is lower than it is for other employee groups, but that's because there's a salary schedule adjustment also for IAFF that we'll get to shortly. For FOP members and the members of the police leadership service, the executive recommends two GWAs, totaling 7%, 4% in July, followed by another 3% in January of 2024. On the bottom of page four, B4, we show the histories, uh, history of GWAs over the past decade. And on page B5, we note about the relationship between GWAs and inflation. And that is that historically, there's been actually minimal correlation between the rate of inflation and the GWAs awarded. In fact, in most recent years, the GWAs have exceeded the CPI, this is the Consumer Price Index, for the previous year. What we did was we looked back going back a decade, and what we found was over the past decade, the compounded GWAs for all employee groups has exceeded the rate of inflation. Service increments, all employees other than management leadership service, police leadership service, and others who are top of grade are eligible for a service increment. The executive recommends 3.5% for this year. Past year service increments, so a little bit of history. The council did not fund service increments for any county employees in FY11, 12, or 13 because of the fiscal constraints associated with the Great Recession. In this year's budget, the executive recommends a 3.5% service increment for McGeo members who are employed in, by the county in FY12, and a 3.5% service increment for IAF members who are employed by the county in FY13. And you'll see on the top of page B6 a table that shows the past year service increments awarded, um, both approved and those that were, were requested but rejected by, by the council. We do note that the Executive refers to the FY12 and FY13 past year service increments in, in his budget as postponed. Staff notes that if you go back to the budget resolutions for 11, 12, and 13, they specified that the service increments were either rejected or not funded. Those are the verbs used. Um, there's no mention of postponement or deferral. MLS and PLS um, 
performance-based pay, pay, MLS is the management leader, leadership service, PLS is the police leadership service. In most years, the executive budget has performance-based pay in lieu of service increments, and that indeed is true for the MLS this year, um, and those are, are budgeted in a separate NDA. For the PLS, the executive does not recommend a performance-based pay, but instead a $1,500 lump sum, $1, lump sum payment the same as provided to FOP members, which we'll mention shortly. As mentioned before, there are salary schedule adjustments in the executive's budget. The first is for correctional officers at level three, which would add a 15th step. And on the top of page B7 is discussion of a, schedules, a salary schedule adjustment for firefighters and rescuers. In, in short, it would be a two-step increase, two steps up to, um, for, for the first 13 steps of firefighters, rescuers, and a single step increase for, for those at the top. There are longevity increments in the executive's budget. Longevity in, uh, increments go to employees who have worked a, a specific number of years. And the table on bo bottom B7 shows that it's a very different arrangement for different em employee groups. In sum, what the executive's budget is for McGeo members, both public safety and non-public safety. The executive's budget would raise the amount of the, of the um, longevity increments, add a third increment, and change the schedule a bit. For non-representative, the executive would raise the amount and add a second longevity adjustment. Bottom of page B8, lump sum payments. As previously mentioned, the executive um, recommends $1,500 of a lump sum payment for all police officers with the exception of new officers who would be about, uh, eligible for a retention, uh, recruitment bonus, which we'll mention soon. Moving forward, top of page B9, continuing on to B10, there are many miscellaneous pay and benefit adjustments that we've just bulleted here. The details are in the, are in the contracts and in the, in the budget, but these include things such as pay differential, field training pay, pay transit subsidy, vision benefit, clothing allowances, those are all in the, in the negotiated agreements. Moving to page B10, in the middle there are things that are included in the CBAs that are specific to public safety issues. Most of these will be discussed in front of the Public Safety Committee, um, but for, for this discussion, just do want to note what was mentioned before, that there's a recruitment and lateral entry bonus of $20,000 for new police hires. Moving on. The cost of the pay adjustments, or more specifically, the fiscal impact. You'll see a table on page 11 that continues on to page 12. What this table does is it lists the fiscal impact of specific pay and benefit adjustments. Um, there's a list of the total costs. That includes both tax-supported and non-tax-supported, and then a separate column for just, for just tax-supported. Each of those have columns for FY24. The FY24 dollar amounts, those are the amounts in the CE's budget for the upcoming fiscal year. But you'll also note a column in each side for annualized costs. And that's there because many of the um, recommended items do not take effect until the middle of the year or near the end of the year. And so the full costs are not realized until the next year. Um, the annualized columns, really what they show is the impact of the FY24 pay and benefit increases on the FY25 budget. And on page B12, you'll see the totals, $61.1 million total cost in FY24, and the annualized cost of just over $100 million. And of that tax supported, the numbers are 51.6 and 79.8, respectively. We do note that the executive's um, budget does include multiple pension plan in, in enhancements. And so the numbers we showed in the chart, in the, in the table, match what is in the fiscal impact statement provided by the executive. But that fiscal impact statement shows that for the pen, pension hand, enhancements, it shows zero annual cost beyond FY24. And we know that the pension enhancements indeed will add unfunded liability to the county's pension funds and will necessitate higher um, annual county contributions. Um, an actual aerial analysis provided to the executive puts the cost of that at about $9.5 million a year for the next 20 years. And so really in the total cost analyzed, we believe the, the total really is closer to $110 million. Moving to page B13, um, we've mentioned that the compensation costs recommended by the executive would grow by 7.9% over FY23 levels. What we've done is we've put together a chart in the middle of B13 
What the blue lines show, that's the carryover compensation costs from the previous year. That's, in effect, the annualization effect. So, for example, $43 million in the bar for FY24, that represents the new costs locked in into this year's budget from FY23 pay increases. And then the yellow bars, those are the new costs realized in that fiscal year, excluding the annualized costs that were lower into the next year. And what the ta table displays is really the unprecedented large compensation increases in the CE's FY24 budget. Workforce size, it's described on B13 and B14. The table shows the increase um, from FY22 to FY24 is recommended of about 4.5 percent in FTEs over two years. And as all of you are familiar with, the, as of early March, there were approximately 1,500 vacant positions in the county government, and the executive has assumed additional laps of $18 million um, in his budget for to help fund FY24 expenditures. The packet goes on to discuss other agencies. We'll skip all of them other than to, to note that the MCPS, um, the Board of Education is currently engaged in contract negotiations, and they have a, a compensation placeholder of $201.5 million um, in their budget. And again, if you're interested in the college or parking planning or WSC, those are, are listed there. We're going to jump forward to page B16. There's a table there that shows the retirement plan costs, the retirement, the number of participants, and the cost per plan by plan type for county government employees. And on the bottom of B16, we have more details on the pension enhancements and other retirement enhancements re recommended by the executive. There's a change in pension multiplier for deputy sheriff and correctional officers. That will increase the maximum benefit. On the top of page uh, 17, there is a military service correct, uh, credit for deputy sheriff and correctional officers, which will, allow, which will grant 24 months of credit at no cost to employees. There is a, a, a correctional staff pension multiplier um, increase, which actually accelerates the benefit to, um, to allow our, um, employees to get a higher pension benefit earlier in their career. Um, there is expanding pension el eligibility for, for staff in the ECC, adding new employees into the pension plan. There's a change to the long-term disability benefit for RSP and GRIP me members, changing the, the payment date for LTD benefits from 70 to 85. There's a change in the pension multiplier for IAFF. This is another one that accelerates the, the, the benefit schedule. On page B18, there's a cost of living adjustment for IAF um, retirees. In essence, it doubles the COLA cap from 2.5% to 5%. And there is a change in the Social Security integration age, which raises the age when the pension benefit is adjusted for Social Security. Again, more details in the packet. And as you're aware, implementation of these would require legislation, and bills have been introduced to affect that. Uh, moving on to page B19, staff does list some of our concerns about the, the, the retirement enhancements, those related to retention disincentive, accelerating benefits to, to an earlier age might work against some of our retention goals. We've mentioned the long-term costs in the actuarial analysis and are concerned about um, policy consistency about different groups. We're going to skip to page B20 in this overview and talk about the funded ratios. The funded ratio means, and this is something the council has asked us to look at and report to you every year at this time, um, it refers to how much the plan's liabilities are covered by the plan's assets. In, in effect, it measures the extent to which the plan has set aside funds to pay the benefits accrued by its members. The table on page B20 shows the current funded ratios for, for each of the agencies that have a pension plan. And we know, going back to the enhancements recommended by the executive, that um, the, the combined package would, re would reduce the pension funded ratio at the county's plan by about 12 percent once each element was factored into a subsequent plan valuation. And with that, I will turn it back to Mr. Howard to discuss group health. Sure, thanks, Aaron. On uh, pages B21 through B23 has information on the uh, contributions for each agency for both active employees and retiree uh, group insurance costs, as well as the recommended OPEB uh, pre-funding. In terms of active employee group insurance, there's no significant changes this year, um, and the budget does reflect the change implemented last year to uh, make all the county group insurance plans funded at an 80-20 cost share. For the OPEB uh, pre 
funding. It lists the different amounts by um, by agency. Uh, the total tax supported amount for OPEB prefunding uh, increasing by 2.8 million over um, FY23, and that's primarily related to funding for um, MCPS. And then we've also included uh, information on page B25 of the agency's um, each group insurance fund balance at the end of the year. Um, the council's policy is for each agency to um, try to maintain a 5% fund balance uh, for their group insurance fund. And so we have information on where each agency um, ended FY22, as well as information on projections for, for FY23. And I'll turn it back to Mr. Trump. So we'll conclude this overview by discussing a council policy, the Compensation Cost Sustainability Policy, which is on the middle of page B25. And in 2021, the council adopted a res resolution that, is, that established or updated fiscal policies, including a policy that states the annual growth rate of total compensation costs should be similar to the annual growth rate of tax supported revenues. And so the intent of this was to align recurring pay and benefit expenditures with available resources um, without requiring offsetting um, reductions or revenue increases. So looking at the numbers, the executive's recommended FY24 budget includes compensation costs that exceed FY23 by 7.9%. This is more than double the recent annual average. In recent years, the average annual growth in compensation was about 3.6%. And so what we do is we compare that according to the, the sustainability policy with projected revenue growth, which the executive's budget show shows growing at about 2.8% annually. That's excluding the, the recommended property tax increase because, of course, those dollars are reserved not for, for county government but for MCPS. So to, to test the sustainability, we compared two spending patterns. First, we compared what would happen if compensation growth grew at 7.9% as recommended by the executive in FY24. And then we followed that by each of the next five years, what would happen if growth reverted back to its previous average of about 3.6% per year. Against that, we compared what compensation growth would look like if it grew at the same rate as revenues. And so the results are shown in the table on the bottom of B26 and the graph on the top of B27. And it does reveal a, a significant, significant sustainability gap. In FY24, the budget would spend $65 million above the council's definition of sustainability. Over the six year period, that gap would increase to um, nearly $600 million. And so our conclusion on, B, on page B28 is that the spending pattern as recommended does produce a sustainability challenge with an outcome of, that a recurring trend of this sort um, would cons constrain the county's ability to meet future spending priorities, including future pay adjustments, and or necessitate r um, raising revenues. Um, with that, we'll conclude our presentation. Again, many more um, items that are discussed in detail, but for this presentation, I think we'll stop here. Okay. Thank you both, Mr. Trumka and Mr. Howard, for, for that thorough presentation, uh, walking us through it and uh, all the number crunching that you did in preparation for, for this conversation. Uh, one of the things that you had said uh, that, that struck me was trying, uh, was looking historically at CPI and how that, um, using that number um, and seeing uh, how our compensation fared in relation to it. And, and I think that that's important for, for framing this conversation because right now we know that we are in record, we have record uh, inflation. Uh, and it is difficult to try to create a, a compensation policy over the last year and looking out into the next year uh, while we are still undergoing this um, macroeconomic situation. Um, it, it is tricky. But we know at the base level that we have a vacancy rate that is, uh, that is extremely high with nearly 1,500 vacancies in government. People, uh, positions that have been unfilled for various reasons, one of which we know is compensation. Another is cost of living in the DMV, and particularly Montgomery County. And so we have to figure out what our compensation policy should be to support those who work for the county and to make uh, our uh, employment uh, 
to make our employment attractive to prospective employees. Um, our, our county residents deserve, deserve that level of, of work. And so let me just pivot uh, to the 1,500 vacancies that we've identified. Uh, and as we've been going through the committee work sessions, I've been following the, the committee's conversations. And on any given day, I know there's between 1,200 and 1,500 vacancies. Uh, and so to pinpoint it on one number, we'll say approximately 1,500. But while we are going through those line items within the budget, uh, and I'll say publicly uh, what my colleagues in the county executive know, that last week uh, I, I sent a memo on behalf of the body uh, requesting the county executive further identify uh, the uh, vacancies and to essentially provide non-recommended cuts in personnel. Uh, some of those positions had been vacant for nearly two years, and if they've been vacant for two years, we have to ask whether or not they should remain vacant or should, they should be stricken from the books entirely. Uh, and so much like we do with all other agencies and departments and ask for non-recommended cuts, I have asked that on behalf of the body to the executive. Uh, and we have requested that that information be provided to us by April 28th, this Friday. And so on one hand, it's hard to have this conversation knowing that there'll be some reductions, expected reductions uh, in personnel. But uh, Mr. Howard and Mr. Trumka, the question I have right now is, uh, should there be further reductions in in the workforce uh, with these vacancies, these long-standing vacancies, those will be savings that come out of the department and agency budgets, but how would they be reflected in, in some of these larger numbers? Not, not the agreed upon contracts, but, but with some of the, the data points that you've shared. So I'll start, and then if you have anything else to add, if I, if I miss anything, Aaron will, will correct me. Um, but I think that the way to look at it is the, the compensation cost is, is a function of two things. It's the cost per employee and the number of employees. Um, so there, there's two different ways to address the, you know, the large scale, you know, big compensation costs. Um, so you know, the, the budget is built on an assumption of a certain number of employees. And so if there is a reduction in the, the size of the workforce, there, the overall compensation cost would, would of course, decrease decrease accordingly. Um, so that is one way to address, you know, compensation costs overall is the size of the workforce. Um, another way to address it is looking at the, the cost per employee. And just a technical point, all of these dollars, almost all of these dollars are already embedded in the different departments. And so to the extent that positions are eliminated, um, the cost would be re reflected as a decrease in those particular de departments. It really isn't a line item for most of the compensation other than let's say the, the retirement costs, but most of the pay and schedule uh, salary are department by department, and this just consolidates it all. Very good. I was wondering if there was going to be a, a double dipping or a recounting of those, of those numbers, and you've, uh, you've answered that question. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to colleagues, and first is Council Member Balcom. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for everyone at the table for all the work that you've done. I know that this is a very difficult, uh, painstaking uh, packet, so thank you. Uh, as Mr. Tomka began, began his remarks, um, it's important to put this decision, this discussion, uh, in perspective um, with the total budget. Uh, the county executive has put the council in a very difficult position. The council's now faced with either passing a 10% increase in property tax or making significant cuts to the proposed budget. And it's impossible for each of us on the council to be an expert on any one line item in the budget, which is why we rely on the committee structure and our central staff to help us make those decisions as a body. So each committee has, has or will painstakingly reviewed each departmental budget to identify cost savings, with one very important caveat noted, noted in every packet that I've reviewed. Compensation will be evaluated separately. So with a um, roughly $6 billion tax-supported budget, $4.2 billion or 70% in compensation, um, even though the committees have spent, will spend roughly six weeks going through this very detailed budget, the council as a body will spend one hour today to make this very important decision on compensation, which would leaves very little room for any substantial uh, changes in the proposed budget. So with the very little time I have today, 
I'd like to just mention a few concerns. Uh, the biggest one, of course, for me, is the structural deficit. Uh, we can't talk about compensation without talking about the proposed structural deficit. Um, as each committee has reviewed our respective department budgets, I'm sure many of my colleagues, all of my colleagues have seen the phrase, FY23 compensation increases are non-discretionary and should be included in the 24 budget. Meaning, once we improve the, approve these compensation increases, we're stuck with them in year 25, year 26, and on and on. So salary and benefits rarely, if ever, go down, and they rarely remain the same. So this, the, the, the increases that we approve today uh, are with us. Um, so this is where we really need to rely on our central staff to uh, help guide us. And as Mr. Trump has already stated, in the middle of page 28, compensation spending produces a sustainability challenge, which will result in either lowering spending in the out years or increasing taxes. So as proposed, the county executive's budget will create an immediate $145 million deficit for the FY25 due to the annualization of increased compensation, meaning if there are no increases in revenue and zero increases in compensation in, the, in year 25, uh, not only will we have a 10% proposed tax increase this year, but we'll have an additional 7% increase in taxes next year. Um, or we need to make some really draconian cuts uh, to, uh, to balance the budget. Um, but I also want, I, I do want to take a moment to talk about the size of the salary increases between 6% and 13% in some cases. Uh, and I'm fully aware of the need to recruit and retain uh, the best and the brightest for our schools, for our public safety. I really respect the work that, that our public safety, uh, the fire and uh, police uh, both here today, uh, and thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I know that we are woefully understaffed in these critical functions as well as HHS. Um, but it's really important to acknowledge that while the average salary in county government is $91,000, the median income in Montgomery County is less than $50,000. And coming from the nonprofit small business sectors, uh, annual increases of even 5%, let alone 10%, are un unheard of. So yes, our teachers, police officers, firefighters, mental health professionals um, need and deserve higher salaries, uh, as most of our employees do. We, we owe it to our taxpayers to at least acknowledge the additional burden that we're placing on them to pay for these increases. Um, as the council president already mentioned, uh, uh, one of the issues that we've been talking about is the vacancy rate. Everyone up here can, uh, has, I, I think, publicly stated and talked about um, the need for transparency and accountability. And in regards to staff vacancies, the lack of transparency has been astounding. Um, we've all been working hard to, 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 to determine how many actual vacancies are funded? How are, how are these positions going to be filled? Do we need these positions? And we've asked for information, and we haven't received information. The information we did receive from the county executive's branch um, showed that some, many positions have been open for 10 years, over 10 years. And when we delve into that data, there's a lot of nuance, and it comes comes to pass that maybe they are, maybe there aren't. So we have to have better, clear, correct data on these vacancies. Um, so take a breath. <laughs> um, to, to the dis decisions at hand, I just want to mention two issues that were brought up in the packet. Um, and one is the um, past service increments, what are sometimes referred to make up steps. Um, I, I'm just adamantly opposed to this practice. Um, uh, as for those listening, um, what this means is that in past years, in this case, FY12 and 23 over 10 years ago, the council rejected um, increment increases. 
um, and uh, we're now expected to to um, make up those in increments, even though that even though they were rejected. Um, I know it's a very small amount, um, and I'm not going to reject the, the the proposal. I just think that it's a it's a um, just a, not a very good uh, policy for us to have to go back uh, once it's once something that the a council is rejected. A council long go long, none of the people up here are, are from that council, um, so I think that that's just a. a, a A, a poor way to to uh, work through this budget, um, and then I also just briefly, lastly, I do have a concern with moving some employees, um, additional employees, into the Divine Benefit Plan. These are employees from the Emergency Communications Center. Uh, defined Benefit Plans are um, the county moved away from them a, a long time ago, uh, over thir um, thirty years ago, for important reasons, relevant reasons um, that, are, that are even more relevant today. Um, and I, I support those, um, our employees that are currently in the defined benefit plan, our public safety officials who put their lives, lives on the line. Um, I have that, that we should reward that. We should take care of our um, employees who, um, who are put in harm's way every day. I just think it's a, a very slippery slope to uh, add people to the defined benefit plan who uh, are not in that category. Um, so I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Balcom. Very much appreciate your comments. Next, Councilmember Sales. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking Chair Kate Stewart and members of the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy for their comprehensive review of the compensation packages uh, for county government employees. I also want to thank our staff for putting the packet together. Um, I appreciate the GO Committee's commitment to ensuring we remain competitive in the marketplace that we, as we strive to attract and retain the best employees. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, so the county executive recommended uh, several enhancements to the uh, employees' retirement benefit plans. For the county government employees, the fund is over 100% pre-funded. As I understand it, given even with these enhancements, the fund would be healthier than other funds. Given the high vacancy rates across county government, but specifically with these positions, are you recommending against a combination of benefits to attract and retain employees? Yes. So just a, a couple things. In terms of the funded ratio, the funded ratio is a snapshot in time that's usually done at the, at the end of the fiscal year. So the latest we have is the one that was done June 30th a year ago, which shows the county at about 103%. Um, per, percent. In all likelihood, the funded ratio that we'll find in a couple months from now will be significantly lower because of the in investment returns. Um, the effect of the combined pension enhancements would drop the funded ratio to um, probably in the neighborhood of 90%. 90%. What we're saying is we're, we're not making a recommendation on what the council should do, but as staff, we are informing you that making up that cost will be a little under $10 million a year um, for the next 20 years. Um, and that's a very real, or very real cost. Failure to make up those costs will just raise annual contributions to the, to the fund year after year beyond that. Um, so we're pointing out to you the fiscal impact of that. Um, staff has not made a recommendation on whether or not the council should, should approve or disapprove that. And just to point out that all the pension enhancements will come before the council separately as, um, as, as legislation. Um, and that's when you'll finally approve or not approve you know, the different elements. Uh, right now, you'll just be, as part of the collective bargaining agreements, you'll just be indicating your support for um, 
funding or not funding the different provisions. Okay, thank you. Um, it's unclear uh, from reading the packet if there was a racial equity and social justice impact statement on the compensation packet or if the racial equity tool was applied during the entire bargaining process. Can you um, please share any information about this? I'd ask the executive branch staff to comment on that. Sure, thank you for the question. My name is Jennifer Harling and I'm the Chief Labor Relations Officer. So during the course of bargaining, um, the parties um, introduced proposals um, and we listened to and work with our union partners to address their concerns on behalf of their members. Um, I don't recall that we had any specific discussion about racial equity and social justice per se, but you know, we're addressing um, the concerns that have been raised by their members that they wish to address. And so that's how we approached bargaining. Okay, okay. Um, I know that the uh, MCPS uh, package has yet to be finalized. Will a similar analysis also be conducted for the MCPS contract? So it's interesting. Going back about a decade ago, MCPS would complete their negotiations with their employee unions um, around the time that the executive released his budget. And so these sessions in a decade ago so did include a parallel analysis of MCPS. In more recent years, the negotiations have continued past March 15th, past the council's decision on the budget, and sometimes go, go well into the next fiscal year. So we have not included analysis because we do not, don't have a package here. Um, if directed by the council, staff is available to, to do that once we see the, the package. Um, do note that the council's role with county government collective bargaining agreements is, is much different. You have a direct involvement in that. In, for MCPS, you're funding the agency as a whole and do not have approval authority over the, the specific collective bargaining agreements. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one last question. Um, the uh, staff packet notes the most modifications to county government retirement benefits would require amendment of the county code and or regulations. The executive's recommended FY24 operating budget includes multiple retirement benefit enhancements for certain groups of employees. Um, it's on page B16 for reference. Can you briefly explain the long-term costs the council should prepare for with the increased reliance on pension funds and a need for more consistency in the policy related to retirement ages? The latter part I can't answer. That, that, that's, that is something that you'd have to get into on the specific enhancements, plan by plan, Social Security integration, COLAs, multipliers, those are very detailed analysis that would require actuarial analysis, um, which you could ask for as part of the discussion of the, of the legislation. Okay. At the macro level, we did ask the executive, and the executive had already um, arranged to have an, an actuarial analysis on the package of the four different groups. There are different retirement groups with different letters. Um, and the combined effect of that would be just under $10 million a year over and mm -hmm. above what's in the fiscal impact statement. And what that $10 million would do would be to, to use a little bit of a technical term, to amortize the unfunded li liability, to restore the, the, the health of the fund to where it was prior to these to these pension enhancements because what you're doing with these pension enhancements is you are giving employees a benefit that they have not neither they nor the county have contributed to in past years so generally with a pension over the term of an employee's tenure with their employer both the employer and the employee are putting money into the fund mm -hmm. to pay for this benefit when you enhance a benefit um, mid-career for a person then he or she will have accrued that benefit, but will neither the employee nor the employer would have contributed. And so that's what creates what's known as unfunded um, liabilities. And to amortize, to put those, to, to, to recover from those, it would take 
about 20 years at just under nine and a half million dollars a year to do. Okay. Thank you. I yield. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Sales. Next, Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you to the GO Committee for great work. Uh, thank you to Mr. Tromba and Mr. Howard for your great work as well. This is not a glass half full presentation, uh, but an important and sobering one. And obviously, uh, I don't disagree with any of the analysis. So four years ago, I joined the majority of the council in turning back the labor negotiated contracts that had been done at the time. Uh, that resulted understandably in a lot of anger and frustration uh, from our brothers and sisters in labor and, and frankly a lot of free career advice too. Um, but it was, um, uh, it was necessary uh, at the time because I was concerned about uh, the implications of uh, the very significant increases that had been proposed. Um, and I shared at the time and will continue to share my experiences having gone through the recession um, 12 years ago when we had to let a whole bunch of really great people go. Uh, and it caused huge disruption in overall county government. But this is different than it was four years ago. And both things can be true. What Councilmember Balcom said so eloquently in her expressing concern about the fiscal cliff that has clearly been identified correctly within this report if we continue on this path without increasing revenues in some other form or fashion. But it is also true that the last three years have been, un have been unprecedented in the history of the delivery of services in county government. And our greatest asset that we have as a government is our employees. And that's true in the council. Uh, we only operate effectively because of the work of our staff who are dedicated public servants and work tirelessly on the behalf of residents every day. Montgomery County has set a high bar for governments across the country, for local governments across the country for generations. And we cannot do anything to go backwards because if we do, then our credibility as a government in the delivery of critical services that in some cases are life-saving services will diminish. And so I am gonna support the GEO recommendation, but I think all of us see this cliff. We've all been through this before and it is not sustainable. And unless something changes, and I can't imagine that after going through the exercise that we are going through right now with a tax increase, that that will uh, happen again any time in the near future, then we need to, as we have in the past, work with our brothers and sisters in labor to make sure that future contracts reflect what the reality is that has been laid out in this report. Because the math here is clear. If we can't afford the salaries we are about to pass now, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, the only place to go is to reduce the county's budget. And when you consider over 80% of that budget is made up in staff and personnel, we would have to reduce staff and personnel as we've done in the past. So, um, and, and I also agree with, um, and, and this is now the fifth time I've done this, the frustration of the quick turnaround. Uh, it's a legit concern. Um, but it is the process, and I do think moving forward, we should explore multi-year contract negotiations with our brothers and sisters in labor to give us all a chance to catch our breath. Um, because there's an arduous process that goes into that negotiation every year, which is a challenging one, and taxes our staff uh, and that of labor um, in a way that is challenging. So it, it is something that, that we need to look at moving forward as a matter of sustainability. Um, but I am going to support um, the GEO recommendations, as I noted. Um, but we all have to have our eyes wide open here with what this means and where we go from here. Um, but I have confidence in this body. I have confidence in our brothers and sisters in labor. I have confidence in the executive branch, um, acknowledging that we are all partners here in the delivery of services to our residents. So I look forward to the ongoing discussions within committees, but we do need to temper expectations because while we are looking at the vacant positions, as the council president noted, and all of us in each committee are, and I very much appreciate his memo, um, there is a reality that's starting to come into focus, and that is that, at least in some instances, 
the work has been filled by contractors or part-time employees. And so it's not a cut to the budget if we eliminate some of these positions. The work has continued just in a different way. And so we can't count on that as a matter of savings. There may be other areas, um, but it will be challenging to say the least. So thank you all very much um, for all the work that you do. And I continue to be proud to work and serve in this community. Uh, and, and I think we're gonna get through this together, um, but I will support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Friedson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to colleagues for thoughtful discussion. Thank you to GEO colleagues for uh, our conversations in committee. Um, just wanted to note a, a few things. Um, first is we had a robust discussion. Actually, the, the vote on the compensation packages was quite short uh, because you know we decided to uh, send this to the committee ultimately. Uh, in that conversation, I had suggested uh, that we delay, that we recommend that the council delay action and get answers to the various questions that we have asked that have not been answered. And, and Councilmember Balcom noted uh, some of that. Uh, ultimately, colleagues uh, thought that we should move forward, which I respect, and uh, I did not object uh, to, uh, to that uh, decision. But I do think that we are in a challenging environment here. We are making a big decision today. Uh, and uh, I support the decision ultimately that we're going to make, but something's got to give. You know, I've said before, I'll say again, hope is not a fiscal strategy. And this is the latest iteration of what has been a repeated insinuation that the uh, executive's fiscal strategy is hope, hope for federal government to bail us out with a lot of resources, hope that the economy would do a lot better than any of us expect, uh, hope for something else to happen. But uh, it is, it's a tough plank to put ourselves out there for, and eventually uh, we're going to get caught uh, in, 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 in that challenge. And I think we have to be, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, concerned about that. And I think we should be concerned about that. Uh, we, we talked about the 1,500 vacancies. You know, I do think we should really have a conversation about how many vacancies, how much of the workforce would we have to reduce in order for the compensation levels to be sustainable. We have real recruitment and retention challenges, especially in public safety and in health and human services. We have to address that. Uh, but we also have to make offsetting choices because something's got to give at some point. We, you know, for five years now, I've been hearing about this grand restructuring of county government. It hasn't happened. It hasn't even started. There was a, a matrix report. We heard about it starting in 2020, I believe August of 2020, uh, that was launched. We got a report uh, then uh, uh, several months delayed, April 15th, 2021. We paid $92,000 for that report. Not a single recommendation in that report has been implemented. Not one. Not one. Several of them were very modest. That, we have 1,500 vacancies as noted. The request of that report was only to find 100 vacancies. I'll note, spending $92,000 to find 100 vacancies for money that we're not spending, we would lose money, but ultimately it would help us embark on this restructuring. Uh, it identified nine supervisory positions. None of those nine have been identified to be eliminated and have been eliminated. None, zero. Uh, there was another recommendation looking at retirements to say when a county employee retires in a supervisory position, we should look at the span of control and a series of other uh, aspects to determine whether or not it's a necessary position or should be repurposed or restructured based on the changing needs of the county. There was a recommendation over the course of the next 18 months from that report, April of 2021, to look at five to 10 percent of the retirements. Not a single one of the retirements that have taken place at an unprecedented moment, by the way, of retirements and of the workforce leaving, unfortunately, which we're concerned about, but not a single change or, or move to, to repurpose or restructure or rethink uh, through those uh, efforts. It is a real challenge, and it's not the fault of any of the hardworking employees of 
OMB or finance or human resources, it, it requires the county executive and the chief administrative officer to send a mandate to the departments to make the changes and to implement a strategy for restructuring. The labor partners have stepped up and they said they are willing to do it. They participated uh, in this work group. They have begged and uh, pleaded to say, we want to be part of a restructuring too. We understand the challenges here, uh, and yet we have nothing uh, to, to show for that. Uh, we only have 552 positions currently as of the GEO committee's work session uh, on this when we dug into it that are being actively recruited. So that means we have over 900 positions that are unfunded and sitting there that are funded and not being actively recruited uh, that we are allocating money for that we will never see a service. We will never see a benefit. And we are heading down a path that is going to exacerbate these issues. And we just, we have to get to a point where we address these issues. We have a response to the compensation policy that is just not, it's not a consistent response. It both takes the 10% property tax increase out when looking at the growth and then puts it back in when looking about at the sustainability. That is not a serious, honest response to a policy. It's one thing to say, here is what we're doing and here's why we're doing it and here's how we're gonna pay for it. We are committing to our public employees who we understand are so important to providing services that are needed now more than ever. But we gotta explain to people how we're gonna pay for it. We've got to explain to people how we're going to make the necessary changes in order to implement it. And we have not done that. That is not happening. That has not happened up to this point. And, and as far as I can tell, we have no idea from the county executive, from the chief administrative officer of any plans to do that moving forward. Even with a consultant's report that's been sitting on a shelf collecting dust after we spent tens of thousands of dollars to make it happen without a single recommendation being implemented. We're gonna start next year with, I think, more than $145 million structural deficit because we have pension changes that we have to address, even in the pension challenges. When we ask questions about that, the response is that the actuarial determined contributions are going to be readjusted year over year. Well, we have to be honest that if we are providing a benefit to employees for recruitment and retention that we're hard fought in bargaining, and I respect that, that that's a cost, and we're gonna have to pay for that. It's either gonna bring, we're either accepting the 12% reduction in the funded ratio of the pension system, and that is a policy decision that we are making, or we're gonna pay 10 million more dollars a year by projection in order to fund it. Neither of those are illegitimate decisions, but we have to be truthful about what the decisions uh, are uh, that we are, are making the $145 million deficit, which you know would be either a major cut or a significant tax increase, a tough choice no matter what. That is assuming that we don't give a single pay raise next year, which I don't think any of us want to do. I don't think any of us are expecting to do. I don't think any of us uh, are, are planning to do. Uh, you know, we, we need to be more serious about the decisions that, that we are making and we need to have more of a partnership from the county executive to do it. If we wanna to make tough choices, if we wanna make changes, we have to accept the consequences and work through the challenges that they create. And we can't just assume that things are gonna get better. We, when we used to have conversations about OPEB and the challenges related to OPEB, the response was, well, we don't even know if we're gonna to have to pay for health care because there could be single payer health care. And that would mean that the, the county doesn't have that obligation anymore. That's not a serious response to a serious policy issue. And I, I just, I, I, we cannot have this conversation without acknowledging that. It is not the fault of a, a single county employee who is working harder than they've ever worked it is not the fault of anybody in our public safety community who is working as hard as they've ever worked and, and facing challenges uh, that, they, that they have never faced uh, before. 
but we, we, we need to do that. We owe it to them to do that. We owe it to them to deal with the vacancies because we had a conversation in GEO the other day of one person doing four people's jobs. <laughs> yeah. So something's got to give here, and it's not uh, in spite of the public employees who are working day in and day out to do this work. It's because of them and the residents who they are serving, and we are here to serve as well. So. I, I will yield back. I could talk about this for a long time. I obviously am very frustrated about the challenges that we face, but uh, we're going to approve these contracts because we understand how important our public employees are and how many challenges they face. But ultimately, we're going to have to make some really tough decisions in this budget and in future budgets, and we need partnership and leadership from the county executive to help us do that. Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first off, I want to thank you all for all of your work. This is hard, well, one, hard to put the packets together, two, hard to sit here and listen to us. So I appreciate your patience. Um, and I, you know, I wholly support moving forward with approving the contracts. I don't think anybody disputed that that would be where I would land on that. But, and I know that we do need to do more to compete for our employees. Um, but employment satisfaction isn't just about the pay and the benefits. We need to do our best to make sure that we're not creating policies, and when I say we, I mean us, or the executive agencies that harm the quality of life in the work environment for our county employees, public safety, overall general government employees, our teachers, et cetera. Because there's no amount of money that's gonna make somebody stay in a job where they say, this is just nuts, I can't stay. And during my time at the state, as agency, certain agencies had a progressively increasing number of vacancies in them. Those weren't just about the pay. We all knew what pay we were gonna get as state employees. That wasn't a mystery. What it mattered was, well, the pay wasn't getting any better and the conditions were getting worse. And the leadership wasn't working. And it declined for a substantial period of time. And now those agencies are trying to come back because a lot of it tanked the worst during the pandemic. And they're still trying to get back so that they can do the people's work and we need to do the people's work, right? But the more we can do to help create a positive climate and culture for our county employees in all sectors, the better off we are in terms of delivery to services for our residents. And that's what matters. We need that to be part of that return on investment for what we're spending on these compensation packages. Um, we, Council Member Balcom and I, were at a uh, CIP fiscal year 25 listening session up county last night. But one of the things, of course, everyone wants to talk about right now, right, because that's what's before them and that's what's uh, most on their mind. There's obvious distress from our residents over the financial implications to individual households over some of the decisions that we all have to make. They're really, really stressed and not happy about it. And part of it is are asking us repeatedly, well, how do we make sure that what we're doing, or if, if the money goes, I don't wanna not fund our schools, I want our schools to be great, but, but you always say there's nothing that you all can do to make sure that happens. Because we don't have that oversight and compliance for the school system. And there are legitimate legitimate and numerous problems with compliance with getting things done within MCPS. I've got four kids in the school system. I see them not just in my own household, but across the board with other students and friends and parents who are concerned. So we, we have a huge job to do and we inherited this fiscal landscape and we know our hands are tied with respect to compliance, with respect to ongoing fiscal management of ex executive departments. And I have extreme concern over the fact that our departments, putting MCPS aside, since we don't have any ability to really deal with their line items, but that we can approve something that's a budget item before us in an operating budget, and then they can move up to 10% of their budget around without our approval because we're appropriating funds that's really just a shell game for positions that aren't gonna be filled, that aren't really there, that haven't been there for a very long time. And then that's money going out the door to things that we didn't say yes to, or that we may spend an inordinate amount of time over the next few weeks trying to trim, and then they go ahead and spend it anyway. 
that's not good fiscal management. So my goals, my hope, my wish, this is why I'm saying this to all of you, um, we need tighter scrutiny over county procurement processes um, and we need to restrict departments on movement of funds of unspent from one line item to another without council's approval. Um, you know, as, as council member Friedson said, we're allocating money for things and not seeing a service. We need to do our level best as a legislative body to make sure that stops. And that's our job to do that. Um, and I think, frankly, based on the number, um, amount of contracts that we end up having where they, they do these contracts for services that are not being provided by employees, and then we end up spending way more for contractual services than we could otherwise um, if we were funding positions um, or doing what we needed to do to recruit because the, the contractual service is the easy way out but costs us a lot more. Finding a way to limit the amount of dollars that can be allocated to a department to be used on contractual services. And of course, we need to realign and reimagine delivery of services and methods so that we're streamlining our workflow for the modern era. Uh, there are a lot of different tools that we could be using, um, and I know we need to, to put those into place sooner rather than later. The clock's already ticking on fiscal year 25 and we haven't even wrapped up fiscal year 24 yet, but that's hanging over us like a big dark cloud based on what we choose to do now. Um, those are inherently linked and without substantial adjustment, we will not improve. You can't tax your way out of this kind of a fiscal problem. And so I'm asking for your commitment to that. Suggestions from our labor partners, from OMB, from OHR, from our council staff, and from my colleagues in engaging in solid fiscal and operational housekeeping measures so that we can stop the bleed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fani Gonzalez. Hi. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the staff. It was a great report, very easy to read, straight to the point. Um, is what I read last night, and it's, it really got to me. So thank you, you did a great job. And I would like to also thank the uh, GEO committee chair and all the committee members for their uh, work on this. I'm gonna go straight to the point. I fully agree with the contracts in front of us. Uh, we're still, you can technically say they were still in a pandemic, and uh, they have done amazing work, and, um, and I just fully support. This is a very expensive county, and um, and I think it is our duty to provide living wages for employees. So I'm gonna you know, embrace this and move forward. I do look forward perhaps in a GL committee session, uh, the points that Council Vice President Fritzen was um, saying about re, uh, re, 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 restructure um, the government uh, is right on point. Uh, and I look, especially if there is already a report that I haven't read, but I will read it. or will send them my way. And uh, maybe during the summer or fall, we can get into that and move us forward. After all, people were really busy during a pandemic, so I don't think they were thinking about restructuring the government while they were keeping people alive. Um, but uh, with that, I'm ready to move forward. Back to you, Council President Evan Glass. Well, we are ready to move forward. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for the conversation and thank you to the GO committee as well for the work to get us to this, this point. Um, this is uh, the first step to determining uh, the rest of the budget. Uh, and so we need to have cons uh, to consider this uh, compensation and uh, benefits uh, and budgetary implica implications uh, thereof. And so uh, we now need, just need to take a straw vote. Is there a motion to, no? So, so almost, we're almost there. Uh, almost there. Well, I <laughs> we, know we have to we just, agree we just to, to the collective bargaining. Yes, so we I just, just need, we need, before we get to that, we need to divide these up into two parts. The first thing, the first straw vote you need to take is on all the compensation items that are not part of the collective bargaining agreements. And so that is on the cover sheet for item number nine on pages two and three, it's section A, um, which is the pay adjustments for um, non-represented and, and um, management employees. It's the group insurance recommendations, the allocations for retirement, and then the county government compensation related NDAs. 
um, and all of those just implement some of the, the things that uh, Mr. Trompka and I discussed, and the GEO committee recommended them all three to zero. So you can take those up as one big block. And would that not be captured under the, the uh, phrasing of compensation and benefits for all agencies? Yes, it would. There we go. Then, then we're on target. Yes. Great. Uh, so uh, we need to take that up. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. uh, moved Second. by Chair Stewart, seconded by Councilmember Jawando. All those in favor of this straw vote, and that is unanimous. Very good. Now we have subsequent items related. Um, Ms. Wellens, let's take up the next item, which are collective bargaining agreements. And the first uh, agreement, uh, well, first let me say I would like to ask for a motion to suspend Council Rules of Procedure, Rule 4B so that we may hold a work session for these resolutions on the same day that they are acted upon. Do I have a motion? Rule 70. 70, not 4B. Yeah. Correct. 7, and then the letter D. 7D, <laughs> thank you very much, 7D. Uh, moved by Council Member, uh, moved by Council Member Katz, seconded. Second. Seconded by Council Member Ludke. Uh, all those in favor of suspending rules, and that is unanimous, thank you. Ms. Wellens. Uh, thank you, Council President, uh, Vice President, and Council Members. So uh, this is agenda item number 10, and I'll be referring to the staff report for item 10. Um, the action items before you are the three resolutions that have been recommended by the GO Committee for your approval. Each uh, resolution represents a separate collective bargaining agreement and all of the specific provisions of those agreements that require council approval. And um, just as a baseline, the council approval is required for the provisions that uh, require an appropriation, have a present or future fiscal impact, or require a change in a legislative uh, change or regulatory change. Um, you can see with regard to um, each of the specific provisions that you'll be indicating your approval of, you can see there's a chart starting on uh, page three of the report that outlines, that goes category by category and outlines um, the, the agreements for those categories with each union. So there's general wage agreements, service increments, longevity increments, et cetera. I won't uh, revisit the substance because Mr. Tronka already um, explain the substance. Um, I will simply note, um, well, or reiterate uh, Mr. Howard's point about the pension changes are dependent upon legislation. That legislation, this approving these resolutions does not preordain that you would have to approve um, the legislation as it was proposed. Those, uh, the public hearing you had earlier today, and those will be going uh, to committee for your further consideration. What these resolutions would do would indicate your intent, assuming the, that the legislation passes, indicating your intent, intent to fund those um, pension enhancements for the coming fiscal year. And the actual resolutions um, are at circles 1, 62, and 76 for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, and the first resolution we will take up is the resolution to approve the provisions of the collective bargaining agreement with the Montgomery County Career Firefighters Association of the International Association of Firefighters. Uh, moved by, uh, by, by Council Member Katz, seconded by Vice President Friedson. All those in favor? That is unanimous. Uh, second item is a resolution to approve provisions of a collective bargaining agreement with the Fraternal Order of Police, FY24, moved by Council Member Katz, seconded by Council Member Sales. All those in favor? That is unanimous. And the third is a resolution to approve provisions of a collective bargaining agreement with the Municipal and County Government Employees Organization for FY24, moved by Council Member Stewart, Second. seconded by Council Member Ludke. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wellens, Mr. Howard, and Mr. Trumka. Uh, Ms. Bryant, thank you and to your staff for being present during this conversation. We look forward to uh, receiving a response to the memo that was sent. Uh, and we hope to receive one uh, from the executive uh, by this Friday, April 28th. Thank you.
Colleagues, we will now move to the consent calendar. May I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So moved. Moved by Councilmember Ludke, seconded by Council Vice President Friedson. All those in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. And with that, we are adjourned for the evening, but we'll come back at 7 o'clock for a public hearing on legislation, uh, at Bill 1223. We'll see you all back at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much.